Duke's process is that he sees that there's something there and he has to kind of feel around a little bit, get towards it, you know, make a variety of brews that start exploring the direction. Turn one, uh, the land from both. Turn two, Brad drops a socket land and a Nihil Spellbomb. And read Farseek, any non-forest. Man, I can already imagine just how many watery graves, or how many, I guess not watery graves, more like breeding pools that Reed Duke is going to be on, on board as stomping grounds and breeding pools. He seems like a man who is going to be far seeking an above average amount of the time. I buy that. He's probably going to want us to go get some like overgrown tombs and, and like breeding pools and control decks. I really like Ravnica Constructed, so seeing that far seek makes me smile. Yeah. And we got another far seek, maybe a rampant, a rampant growth. growth? Yeah. Rampant growth. Brad with no black mana means he can't cycle his Nile Spellbomb, and he looks a little slow to get going. He doesn't have any wellsprings, doesn't have, you know, doesn't have a trade. He doesn't have anything really going yet. He's just kind of, kind of hanging out. Although the Selim Simulacrum is a huge step in the right direction. It gives him the black mana that he needs for the Nile Spellbomb, but it also. It's a source of future card advantage because he's got so many buried ruins in his hand and in play that uh, he's going to end up just drawing lots of extra cards, particularly if he finds a way to sacrifice the simulacrum, such as a Phyrexia's core. And Reed untaps, getting to that critical six mana mark. That Salem was the There's best the six. thing he could have drawn. And Primeval Titan, ouch. Now, I will say one thing about Reed Duke's list. Unlike a lot of these ramp decks, if you cast a Primeval Titan in those ramp decks, the game was just basically nearly over, except for against a very narrow slice of cards. Reed's deck has only one Ink Moth Nexus, so it's not necessarily over, it's just probably over. Yeah, I mean, a single, you know, if Brad, like for instance, right here, if Brad goes Day of Judgment, kill your Titan, and then has a single removal spell, at least there's a game. Yeah. You know, Reed still has the, uh, the, the wolf run. But most likely, Reed's just going to follow with another six, and uh, that'll be that. And uh, to be fair, Brad's main deck, other than sorcery speed effects, he does not have ways to deal with creatures that are not tumble magnets. So a Ink Moth can go a long way against him. Absolutely. And uh, he really just doesn't have any, like, he doesn't have any flyers, doesn't have... Yeah, his main deck, he just doesn't have any outs. I mean, he's got Gideon. Gideon, which is a... A road bump. And there's the day. Draw the card. But really, Brad is just on a two-turn clock here. If he doesn't get Tumble Magnet or Gideon, now it looks like he does have the Gideon in his hand. But... Which basically makes it a three-turn clock, or maybe a four-turn clock, right? Yeah. A short little while to kill the Gideon, and then you're back at it. Oh. Or another Primeval Titan. Yeah. This one's looking pretty good for Reindeer Rabbit. Two hundred giant seal competitors. <laughs> FF Freak versus Reindeer Rabbit. That's right. Let's gain some life. Two of the most notorious Magic Online players, which if you want, you can uh, nominate or vote for for the Community Cup. Um, what's the webpage for that? Do we have that laying around? Because both of these players are people who are going to be getting some votes this year for the uh, Community Cup. Pretty tough competition. Brad Nelson, Reed Duke, uh, Brian Kibler, Luis Scott Vargas, uh, Tristan Sean Gregson, um, Michael Jacob, uh, Michael Hedricks, lots of, lots of, lots of, I'm, friends over at MTG Cast. Community Cup's gonna be pretty thick this year. And I'm going to tweet that link because the unfortunately Wizards of the Coast has not made it an easy to uh, to say. Oh yeah, like, yeah. Everybody, just remember it's uh, question mark slash H T M M three two capital Q M three. <laughs> very very close. Very very close. So Brad's got a worm coil engine down. He's uh, he's going to make a good a good fight of it. But Reed Duke slowly building up to the point. Well, not even that slowly. Quickly building up to the point of an Ink Moth Nexus killing in one hit. He doesn't want to fall for the waste of my turn, making you only mostly dead, because mostly dead is still very much partly alive. I was hoping you would say that. I was going to go there if you didn't. <laughs> and uh, 
the worst thing that could happen is if he wastes his time doing that and Brad drops a tumble magnet and suddenly it's like, wait a minute, am I, could I actually lose this game? However, he's up to uh, 10 mana, meaning he's, he's actually not that far off, particularly if he gets to hit with Primeval Titan, putting him at 12. It only takes 14 mana before you kill in one hit. That's not very much. Or no, is it 14? I guess it's 15 mana. I think it's 15 mana. Because you have to have three, one. The Nexus plus nine, one is 13, and the three 12, for the Wolf Run. Oh no, it is 14. It's 14. It is 14. 14. The Nexus you had is, it right with your instincts. Absolutely, dude. I've, I've died that way enough to know. Ah, so from the looks of it, this is... Uh, all over, but the crying is what I usually like to say. Oh, we'll see. I mean, basically what Brad has to do is get a magnet down ASAP. And then still deal with that prime evil type. I don't think ASAP is fast enough. It's now or never. He still has a, Why did he cap his black mana? He still has a Gideon that he can use to stay alive for a turn. Well... I don't know if he needs the triple white, but, but all right. Here's the Gideon, buying some more time. Attack my Gideon, please. And the nice thing is that Brad can block with his worm coil, so it's not even like the Grave Titan is the biggest threat in the world here. However, Reed should have more than enough mana to, uh, to finish off Gideon even after trampling over the worm coil. Right? Gideon is not long Is that this enough? World. One, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eleven. Yeah, so he's got enough. And if you're Brad, you're just gonna block here. Yeah. Like, you, you ought. Yeah, you got to. He's just gotta, I mean, first, make Reed use the mana. But second, um, like, the Worm Coil's not doing anything for you. And that Primeval Titan is destroying you. At least this way, if he draws a magnet, like, he's got control. Sort of. More Glimmer Posts. Reed's life total. Skyrocketing. And we see the Wolf Run. He's like, ah, all in. Yeah. Dead Worm Coil. Dead Gideon. And a fresh pair of, oh, Doctor, three threes. Anthony Eaton and Christian Calcano tokens on the battlefield. At the end of the turn, I think we're going to see, and there it goes. Boom. Nile Spellbomb. Drawing a card. For those of you who are just joining us, I'm Adrian Sullivan. I'm here with Patrick Chapin. We are watching the first game between Reed Duke, Brad Nelson, in this round five of the Star City Games Live Open Series here in Buffalo, New York. And draw, draw, look for answers. Attack. Leave mana open because while we have the benefit of having deck lists in front of us, Reed does not. Reed does not know that there are no, no removal spells that can deal with that ink moth. No doom blades. Not, this is, this no isn't going to happen. Incinerates. Though. Reed is definitely going to finish the no, job. No. Let's see what else. No uh, divine offerings, no gut shots. Ancient grudges are smelt. There's the inky. Attack. I think Brad wisely not trying to indicate he even has anything. Because indicating that he has something would be... I mean, it's probably not going to matter, but boom. That's it. I think Brad in terms of trying to pull off that bluff, was playing it like he should against Absolutely. a player like Reed Duke, player not like Reed doing Duke, anything else. His, yeah, his only, his only game plan against Reed Duke in that case, Reed's way, way, way too seasoned for any of the trick stuff. Yeah. The best way to represent strength there is to be stone-faced, do nothing. Yep. And then maybe if Reed has a different line of play, like Brad's only hope is that Reed has another six in his hand that's so good that maybe Reed says, well, you know what? It's not worth risking it. I could just play around it. I'll, I'll get him next turn. Yep. One thing to remember, now you can't bluff somebody who 
won't see it because they're not good enough. But also, you can't telegraph the bluff against someone who's good enough to realize that a telegraph is a false tell. What's it they always say? You can't con an honest man? It's the same thing. You can't bluff an honest guy. <laughs> is it that you can't con an honest John? Yeah, <laughs> that's, absolutely. That's a good album, actually. Ah, oh, it's a way of life, really. <laughs> you know, assuming you're a grifter. <laughs> and uh, if you have played Magic long enough, you might have at some point come across Magic grifters in your doubt time. They're, they're dangerous to have around, but they can be entertaining. Read Duke and Brad sharing a smile. These guys, right now, they're friends, but they're they're playing to stay in this tournament. This is score SCG Black 1, SCG Blue 0. Mm. <laughs> Who will emerge victorious? I gotta say, it's been real good to see the uh, the kind of the change in momentum of Brad Nelson over the past few months. The SCG Blue experience. Moving to Roanoke, uh, being surrounded by guys so that he gets regular playtesting in. Um, he's in his element, he's starting to get yeah. his groove back. It's been awesome. And seeing just the amount of leadership from Brad, it's been kind of awesome. Just, I mean, obviously Jerry is a veteran to leading groups of playtesting and whatnot, but Brad has really stepped up and taken a leadership role as well. And, and the influence they've had on some of the other SCG Blue guys, it's been real, real positive I, I, and real good. It's, it seems like they're a growing force in Magic. I think the influence they've had on each other. Um, you know, Aww. No, I'm, I'm serious though. I mean, I've worked with Jerry in the past, and, and I think that he's used to being the king of the mountain. And when he has somebody else there that's worth listening to and worth sharing that power with, I think that he has he's gotten a lot out of that. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what was said there. But Watching it was the, awesome. the faces of these awesome. two. A couple of good kids. You yeah, know these, these are some good guys. It's funny because uh, since Brad has moved away, it is kind of sad playing in um, events in the upper Midwest. Brad would be a fixture at PTQs. He would usually just be there to hang out. He was often, uh, you know, not even... He could potentially in some of those events play for the prize, even though he was already qualified. But in that, like, couple of years there, he would just show up for the times just to hang out and watch his friends and talk. And now... Not so much. He lives in Roanoke. How many people do they got down there? There's Brad, Jerry, Gindy, Cho. It's starting to be a little bit like Curacao. Well, <laughs> <laughs> kind of Curacao, it's tricky. Like Curacao is the island where gamers go to die, whereas like <laughs> Roanoke seems to be the, uh, the, you know, out in the wilderness where gamers go to break through. <laughs> You know? I, it's funny because uh, Curacao, I always like to think of as the Dharma Initiative. And we have a uh, post on the right in the hands of Brad Nelson and uh, Reed Duke, Wolf Run Blue. Do you think that trading post is going to take over for Outpost, Kildoran Outpost, as the card people think of when they hear the words post? Is it going to be ubiquitous enough to do that? I'm, I'm, I'm fairly sure that Trading Post is post-post enough to not even be thought of. Like, I think Outpost is too pre-post to be a post in today's world. Well, you mean, I, you mean post M13, though, right? Right. Well, no, no, no. I'm not even sure. Is, is Outpost really the post that people think of? So you're thinking, like, post even maybe Ravnica? I mean, when, when was the last time anyone played with Kelder and Outpost at all? 1998? I think it's at least post, like even if it's post 99, like the amount of posting going on now is, I don't know, trading post anyway is much different. Salam Simulacrum, you're gonna get the mountain, right? I don't know, your rationale sounds kind of ex post facto to me. But it's correct. True. <laughs> A little tidbit for all of you out there who like to talk about um, fallacies. Fallacies do not make a proposition false. So we've got two swamps from Brad Nelson. Why did he get the second swamp? What is his double black in his deck? Why would he do that? He doesn't have double black, right? Um, he could potentially double threat, duress plus a black spell. I don't know. Maybe he just has he has multiple red cards in his hand, or multiple red sources in his hand, and it doesn't matter. He could also just be scaring Reed, like make you know, like respect my grave titan or whatever. 
Increasing ambitions, only single. But I suppose if the game goes real long, he can cast it and flash it back same turn. <laughs> All it takes is 13 mana. 12, right? Also, at 4 o'clock, 13? 13. Wow. Flashback on that beast is 8. <laughs> Feels like it should be 7. You gotta mean it if you want to increase your ambition. Solemn Simulacrum. At any cost. It is 5 mana v 5 mana. Read back quickly approaching the dangerous 6 mana mark. This seems like a matchup danger, that, danger. that very fares Reed Duke. And you yep. basically, you've got two mid-range decks, I would say, and then one of them has Primeval Titan. Well, oh, I mean, Mind Slaver! Traditionally, the uh, the ramp deck has been very good against the board control deck. Yeah, and I mean, it, on the back of Primeval, though, right? That's usually the... Well, just, the ramp deck is basically a combo deck. It's a slow combo deck, but it is a combo deck, and board control decks are notoriously weak to those sorts of things. Ancient Grudge taking out Mind Slaver. Looks like Brad's gonna need to get a training post going to get that going. That's, uh, that is a tough, tough break. And it's not even like Mind Slaver is the sickest thing ever. I mean, Reed Duke's deck is not powerful enough to kill itself successfully. That's funny. Primeval Titan. I mean, that Ink Moth Next is so deadly for Brad Nelson. And after sideboard, Brad has zero ways to deal with it. Just the Tumble Magnet. Oh, he's Spine, spine. of Ishsa. Pardon me. Spine yeah, Spine of Ishsa. is, you gotta, you gotta go hard and you gotta go long. And, but mostly, I think you gotta just go to the two losses bracket. So, Reed Duke. Primeval Tightening. Brad, no Brad Nelson's developing a bit of a reputation for his love of trading post, but I wonder if, like, is Dega really the best way to trading post? There are things about it I really like. Um, what would you put Which forth as a I, possibility? Like, I mean, mono black. I like mono black. Blue black Tezzeret. I like that. I know Brian Kowal has been working on a mono blue version, along with uh, Midwest player Bob like Baker. Like Grand Architect? Yeah. Yeah, I can see it. If you're into that sort of thing. And a lot of mana for Karn. Nope, Primeval Titan. Off of a Green Sun Zenith, perhaps. Is that seven mana? No. So Reed Duke. Oh, he already got it. He got a land out immediately. That's why it looked like seven mana. Original modern powerhouse Glimmer Post versus Quite possibly the greatest draft pick possible of all time, if for Wellspring. <laughs> I like this Pro Tour stamped Primeval Titan. Let him know you mean business. Another day. Another, Another day. day. Oh, oh! And, and Brad again. says that's it. So, Reed Duke very handedly defeats Brad Nelson 2 0 wow. with his Wolf Run Blue deck versus Degapost. Oh, Reed Duke, very happy about this. Brad Nelson, very happy that Reed Duke is happy. Less happy about why. Is is? I'm just thinking about Dega in the past, and I always think about just essentially uh, draft for the most part. You always just think about draft when it comes to Dega. Uh. Like I think the only times that I've really seen, I mean, Fabiano used Team Italia as like that color all the time. combination. Yeah, all the time. And uh, then before that, Ped Bun a long time ago, but it's just not a color combination.